Welcome to Fireside Giants, and my name is Alex, and my co-host, Anthony Gold, past member, Rivardo. Today, we're talking wide receivers, in fact, the top five in free agency, and who the Giants should look to, because, you know, this is this is going to be a big focal point for them going forward. John Mara said in his press conference to end the season, and Dave Gettleman um, kind of mimicked the same thing, that they need to allocate resources toward the offense, toward the receivers, and really make sure that they have... Um, the the appropriate weapons for Daniel Jones to utilize in 2021. But before we dive into the nitty gritties and all the receivers that we think the Giants might actually look toward, here's my joke of the day. It's they keep getting worse and worse, but <laughs> maybe you guys will enjoy this one. How many Philadelphia Eagles does it take to change a tire? How many? One, unless it's a blowout, in which is the case they all show up. <laughs> Okay, I laughed at that one. I did laugh. So I got a, I got a you're, you're making progress. You're making progress. Was that a seven out of ten this time? That's what I was thinking. I was gonna give it a seven. Seven out of ten. You're getting there. It's better than my six. One day you'll crack a ten. Five. One yeah. day. The you're one tenor I had was here better. for. Yeah, <laughs> that's a shame. Oh well. Yep. Well, <laughs> I'll take what I can get. If you have any jokes, leave them in the comment section on YouTube. I'd love to give some jokes. Um, that you or guys don't. come up with it and tell, tell them on live uh, <laughs> or don't I would prefer you do because I like this portion um, I always get a, a crack out of, out of Anthony and it's hard to get him to laugh sometimes so this is my one chance it's usually a cringe or a laugh but I'll, I'll take somewhere in the middle nonetheless Anthony how are you doing my friend I'm doing good just moves back into school you know my apartment uh, at school so that's been kind of you know it was a long day yesterday, just packing every or unpacking everything rather, and you know making the drive up here. But I'm here now, and I'm ready to get back into the swing of things, and you know continue talking Giants football. Absolutely, and you know we've done a couple videos the past few days. If you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, we have awesome new graphics um, on the videos. I've been trying to put some clips in so you guys can see, you know, the players while we're talking, and really get an idea of you know what we're trying to do here and upgrade the content. But of course. We're talking wide receivers today, and this is Anthony's favorite position group, um, you know, and there's a lot of good free agents out there this year, depending on price and, you know, what kind of talent the Giants want if Jason Garrett sticks around. There's a lot of different factors that are going to play a part in who the Giants spend money on, if they do at all. They might actually just wait for the draft and take a guy like Jalen Waddell. Maybe they hope that a guy like Devonta Smith drops, very unlikely, but Jalen Waddell is another guy who's a phenomenal athlete, maybe Kyle Pitts, the tight end, who can cross-train at both wide receiver um, and tight end, you know, we'll talk about him. We'll do a film review on him, of course, and what he brings to the table. A lot of people have been bringing his name up recently. So I think, you know, he's someone that's worthy of discussing in the future. But this is a free agent video, so we're going to really talk about these first guys. And I'm going to bring up the first one, which is Anthony's favorite of the of the bunch. Um, that's Kenny Galladay, when he's healthy, at least. Anthony really likes Kenny Galladay. And I'll, I'll, I'll list some stats off, and I'll give Anthony a chance to kind of give you a read. Give you a few reasons why he's his favorite and why he might be a great fit for the Giants, especially if Jason Garrett stays. So, you know, 2020 was a pretty tough year for him. He missed uh, 11 games um, due to a couple injuries, and that's kind of really the major, the major talking point when it comes to Galladay. The injuries really took a toll. He only finished with 338 yards and two scores. But in 2019, he had a Pro Bowl caliber season with 1,190 yards and 11 touchdowns. So he's a big, big guy at six foot four, 214 pounds. They call him Baby Tron. He's kind of that big body receiver you can throw up to in man coverage, 50-50 um, balls, and he'll come down with it. You know That is what he's good at doing, and I think that's kind of what Jason Garrett likes with his offense. But because he was injured this year, I think the Giants might be able to land him on a more cost-efficient deal, especially with you know the COVID-19 uh, pandemic hurting the salary cap. They're expecting it to go down significantly, and if that is the case, the Giants could potentially land him on a cost-efficient deal, maybe one year prove it, you know, trying to translate that into a, a multi-year deal in 2022 and down the road. So I think maybe if he's willing to take a one-year deal, let's say 12, 13 million, I'd be willing to roll the dice on him, especially if the Giants are considering drafting a wide receiver as well, really giving him, um, Daniel Jones rather, the weapons to utilize and, and making sure that this, uh, this offense doesn't rank 31st in the NFL again in points per game. But Anthony, my friend, you know, what do you think about Kenny Galladay? What does he bring to this offense? And why do you like him so much? Yeah, I like him so much because he's the most realistic option for the Giants between him and Allen Robinson. When you look at those top two wide receivers in the free agent market, Kenny Galladay is just more realistic for the Giants um, in terms of price and in terms of, you know, scheme fit, everything like that. I mean, Allen Robinson's dominant. He'll fit in any scheme, and we're going to touch on him as well. But, you know, really with Kenny Galladay, he's coming off of that injury 
um, and he's a bit younger. And, you know, I guess there are some question marks I could bring his price down. Plus, the Giants are actually, like, interested in him. Like, we know for a fact that they are interested in Kenny Galladay. They called the Lions in October interested in um, making a trade for Kenny Galladay. So that's clearly I- indicative of their offseason plans. You know, it in- indicates to me that they are going to try to get Kenny Galladay, you know, and sign him in free agency if he hits the open market. And I think that he will. It seems like, you know, uh, as every day goes by, it seems more and more likely that he's not going to get the franchise tag and that he's actually going to end up a free agent in the offseason. So given that, given his, you know, lesser price compared to Allen Robinson, and given the fact that the Giants are knowingly interested in Kenny Galladay, he's my favorite just because he's a realistic option. And, you know, a lot of the times Giants fans will get excited about free agents and they'll think that the Giants are going to go after this guy or that guy, and they're not. It's never been in their plans, so you were just like hoping and dreaming and praying that they would sign this guy that they never intended on. This one, they actually do have plans to at least, you know, explore the possibility of signing Kenny Galladay. So this one is a realistic option. This could actually happen, so that's why I actually am excited about it. I don't think Allen Robinson is a realistic option for them. I don't think that they can afford him. Um, and, and I don't really know if they can afford Kenny, Kenny Galladay either, but they definitely can't afford Allen Robinson, I don't think. And then Allen Robinson, I, I don't know if he's going to want to come to the Giants. I think he's going to want to go somewhere with a proven, established veteran quarterback and try and, you know, make one last run at a Super Bowl before he gets too old. He's already 27 years old or whatever. So, you know, I think that he's, you know, dealt with a lot of bad quarterback play throughout his career, whether it was his time in Jacksonville or in Chicago. So I think he's just going to want to finally you know, make his way to a team with consistent quarterback play. And, you know, Daniel Jones, while we do believe in him, think he's good. He's, he's very unproven still, you know, he he hasn't taken that stride and established himself as, you know, a serious uh, quarterback um, yet, like a franchise quarterback. So that that's why I don't think Allen Robinson is as realistic. Maybe you disagree. You could bring up the stats on him as well, because he is an extraordinary talent, but Kenny Galladay is the realistic option of the two, given those factors. And I think that he's a super talented playmaker that the Giants would love to have in their offense. And I think that him and Daniel Jones teaming up could be, you know, a phenomenal thing for the Giants offense. And we could see him, you know, surpass a thousand yards once again and, you know, maybe even put up eight touchdowns and really uh, take the pressure off of the other wide receivers and stop um, and then open things up in the running game as well for Saquon Barkley. Yeah, I mean, with Kenny Galladay, I do want to talk about his scheme fit. You know, let's assume that Jason Garrett does stay with the Giants because if he doesn't get hired by the Chargers, I don't think the Giants want to change coordinators for a third season. Obviously, like I would prefer that they do, just because the offense can't get much worse than it was from last year. Um, but the reality is, likely chance he's going to stay with the Giants. And if that is the case, we know what Jason Garrett likes. He likes big body receivers. He likes that one possession guy that you can throw to that has elite qualities. You know, like a Des Bryant type of player. Kenny Galladay fits that mold to perfection. That is why they were interested in him during the trade deadline. You know, he is that six foot four, two hundred and fifteen pound, big body who Daniel Jones can throw the ball up to um, and, and really target with his first read and will come down with it. He can box out corners, he can stack, he can do all the things he want in a number one wide receiver. Health is just the major problem. You know, that's that's a big thing for a lot of players. You know, you talk um, about Jadeveon Clowney as a pass rusher. There's a, there's a reason why he is not going to get paid a lot of money this next uh, upcoming offseason because he's been injured. Um, so Kenny Galladay might be a great opportunity for them to cash in, um, you know, on a low on a low price player who has a lot of great qualities that they can maximize. Now the problem with him um, is that the Giants want someone who can be healthy. You know, that that's my biggest concern. If you're going to, you know put all your chips in on Kenny Galladay, you need him to be there week in and week out for Daniel Jones because the second he's out a game, he's out five, six, seven, eight games, he was out 11 games this year, the second he misses that time, you're back to square one. You know, you're back to 2020 again where you can't push the ball downfield and you have lackluster talent. Of course, Saquon Barkley will be back, but who knows what he's going to be like when he gets back. Um, so that leads me to Allen Robinson. You know, you just talked about him a little bit, but he's a guy who really represents the cream of the crop of this Um, free agency class, especially for wide receivers. Like you mentioned, he is 27 years old, so he's a little bit on the older side. He's getting toward um, the the middling of his prime, I would say. I think he still has a lot of good football left in him. But I actually saw a crazy stat today that said on 64 (laughs) – it's actually insane. From his quarterbacks that he's played with, you know, Mitch Trubisky, Foles, only 64% of his targets were catchable passes. 
64% of passes thrown his way were deemed catchable. That is disgusting. That is embarrassing. You know, let alone uh, the production he put forth. This year, he had 1,250 yards and six scores. You go back to 2015, he had 1,400 uh, yards and 14 touchdowns. You know, he's a very talented player, incredibly talented, and he's a guy you bring into this team, and he's your number one uh, wide receiver instantaneously. You know, he opens up the game. He can create separation. He has a very good catching ability. He can push the ball downfield. Um, you know, he averaged 12.3 yards per reception. Um, he used to, he actually averaged 17.5 in 2015, so he's capable of playing that vertical style run, uh, passing attack, you know? And that's the problem with Jason Garrett, though. He doesn't push the ball downfield enough. I want to see those yards per reception go up um, for every receiver. You know, that that is how I, um, I actually want them to operate in the future, you know? Yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot about the offensive scheme and our grievances with it, but, you know, um, to give Jason Garrett a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, signing one of these receivers could actually alleviate a lot of the problems that we see in this offensive scheme. You know, I, I don't necessarily think it'll be, you know, a, a fixed offense and it'll be phenomenal once we sign a wide receiver, but I think that we'll definitely see some improvements. And, you know, because he, um, Jason Garrett was somebody who really thrived his offense thrived when they did have that primary number one wide receiver in Des Bryant over in Dallas and then of course it struggled when they didn't have that number one wide receiver Dallas traded for Amari Cooper and then their offense was explosive again so you know to give him the benefit of the doubt like I said maybe all he needs is just that number one wide receiver that can you know open things up in other facets of the game and really just be a dominant you know force on the Giants offense so you know hopefully we could see a breakout from the offensive unit once we get that wide receiver but of course I'm not going to get my hopes up too high with Jason Garrett I do still believe that you know he isn't the best at scheming together an offense and calling plays I, I think the Giants could do better I hope that they figure something out and maybe add somebody to this coaching staff maybe a passing game coordinator I've been saying that for a little bit now I wrote an article about Anthony Lynn as a potential passing game coordinator for the Giants I think that would be a really good idea um, so I hope to see them maybe, you know, add a passing game coordinator, but overall, I just think, you know, when you look at this offense and you look at Darius Slayton and Sterling Shepard and Golden Tate, you know, there is a lack of talent at the wide receiver position. So to give Jason Garrett and the Giants offense and Daniel Jones, even the benefit of the doubt, maybe next year, once they have that number one wide receiver, whether it comes through free agency or the draft, we will see a much better offense. And if we do not, then absolutely Jason Garrett needs to be fired on the spot if it's not improved by week eight. <laughs> I just can't even fathom the idea of Jason Garrett getting worse. You know, like I've been having, I've been going back and forth with someone on Twitter today, um, and he, he actually is, is very analytical with the way he thinks. So he proposed a couple different reasons why Jason Garrett isn't the reason for the Giants faltering on offense. And the major one to me was, you know, he did establish a good running game. You know, that is something that we can all agree on. He maximized Wayne Gallman and Alfred Old Man Morris. That, that is something he did positively. Um, but the route concepts, we saw way too many hooks, too many this, too many that. And his response, you know, was, was more or less, the offensive line wasn't great. The pass blocking wasn't great. Daniel Jones wasn't good enough quarterback um, to stand in the pocket for seven seconds without fumbling. They were trying to get the ball out quickly on first reads. Um, but the problem is, I would rather him just take shots downfield, run verticals, run go routes, you know, push the ball downfield and then, and then get guys underneath. My, like, you can, you can scheme an offense um, that focuses on underneath routes, but you don't have to run every receiver on hooks and, and you know, slants. That was my biggest concern was if you want to use the underneath game, you have to clear out the middle of the field. You know, you cannot have everybody curl into the middle of the field and, 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 create traffic in that area, you have to utilize your boundary receivers to push them up the field, take guys in the secondary with them, and then you can drag your tight ends, let's say, let's say, you know, Caden Smith, Levine Toilolo, Evan Ingram, drag them across the formation, um, you know, get guys in motion, use Sterling Shepard in the slot, Golden Tate, whatnot, um, and, you know, drag these guys underneath. That, that was kind of my biggest concern. So for the most part, I think the Giants kind of underwhelmed in the, in the offensive scheme category, and there's a lot of things that Jason Garrett did very poorly that, that disappointed me. Uh, but the running game was good. Like, the running game was something that we can, we can harp on. But if you, if you add a guy like Allen Robinson, if you add a guy, you know, like, um, 
even even Kenny Galladay, Curtis Samuel, Corey Davis, Juju Smith-Schuster. We're going to talk about all these guys. If you add any of them and you and you get Saquon back and you can't produce any more than we did last year, he should have been fired. He should have never been hired. You know, that's the reality. I think he was more of a hiring to help Joe Judge's transition and not as an offensive coordinator. He hasn't called plays since 2012. You know, we're talking. And he came in, and we really we were banking on him stealing some of Kellen Moore's offense. That was why I was excited about him initially. I was like, Jason Garrett, at the very least, bring some of Kellen Moore's downfield um, offense to to New York. That's why I actually had any faith in him. Um, but that quickly dissipated um, as he as he ran curls with Evan Ingram and all of his receivers and did nothing. Uh, but but shorten the field for Daniel Jones when DJ is one of the most accurate deep ball passers in the NFL. So you know that's my biggest concern. Um, but you know like what do you what do you think? Do you think that he will actually start to open up this playbook um, once the offense gains another weapon or two? Yeah, I think he will. I think it'll make a big difference once he has that number one wide receiver that he can you know scheme plays around and run the offense through. Um, they just really need a guy like a Kenny Galladay or an Allen Robinson or even a Devontae Smith or Jalen Water. You know, that primary number one receiver who can just separate and get open um, no matter the route that he's running, you know. Um, but overall, you know, I don't think the offense will see significant improvements until we see significant changes within this scheme. Uh, you mentioned all those hook routes, you know. Um, uh, that stuff needs to change. You know, there's a time and a place for hook routes, but when they're being called on every single play and you're not pushing anyone down the field vertically, you're just really allowing the defense to sit down on all of those intermediate routes and just eat them up. So uh, the Giants do eventually need to start getting more vertical and pushing things downfield. But maybe once they get a better deep threat, you know, more consistent deep threat, a guy who can get open downfield, uh, maybe that will actually change things. And then we'll see the offense open up and some of those plays that we didn't like last season are going to get thrown out of the playbook and into the trash bin. So hopefully that's what happens. And then, you know, maybe he can put a few new pages into the playbook and some new plays that are actually a little bit more creative and maybe steal something out of, you know, uh, Kyle Shanahan's playbook or something, you know, start to get more progressive with the way that we run this offense. You know, uh, like you mentioned, Kellen Moore has a very, you know, a forward thinking offense, very uh, pass attack heavy and a lot of pre-snap motion, all that kind of stuff, you know, those buzzwords that we love to talk about and, you know, that we hear all the time from the top NFL analysts that are discussing the top NFL offenses. So hopefully we could see more of that stuff get implemented into Jason Garrett's offense so we could see this team really take it to the next level because not just take see the offense take it to the next level, but the entire team will benefit because the defense will be on the field less, so they'll be more sharp and playing better. And then, of course, you know, the defense just kept us in a lot of games and won us a few games and held everything together. If it wasn't for the defense, we probably won't lose even more games than we did. So the Giants offense really just held the team back. And now hopefully we can see improvements next year and see the whole team move forward because of it. That is my favorite argument. It really is. That That is my favorite argument because you think about how well the defense played this year. They were a top 10 unit how well they played this year with so much adversity. And if you give them an average offense that keeps them off the field, keeps them rested, keep, keeps them healthy, you're talking about a top five defense, top three defense. You know, if you take them off the field and you put them on and they're that good, you're in such a good shape moving forward. And all it takes is an average offense for the Giants to get that done. And they need, they have to see that. You know, that that is a pretty clear cut thing, in my opinion, when you're looking at the Giants. Like, if you give them the average offense, you will see the defense perform even better. And guys like Blake Martinez, guys like James Bradbury, we're talking all, all pro level seasons because when you force them to go on the field, they're gonna. You can only play so long before you get gassed, before you make mistakes, before you give up a touchdown, before your stats start to to show. You know how much you're on the field. So I think you know you're talking about a couple guys on that on that Pro Bowl list next year that weren't on there before. Maybe some All Pro guys when you have an offense that keeps them off the field. Um, but to, to move back to the wide receivers, you know, the next guy I want to talk about is Curtis Samuel, because Curtis Samuel is another option the Giants could look at, maybe another one-year deal type of guy. I think he's going to be looking for multi-years. He's a New York native. He's actually was, he was born um, 10 days before me, August 11th, 1996. I'm August 21st, 1996. Kind of interesting. So he's super young, 24 years old. He's a Brooklyn, New York native. Um, 5'11", 195 pounds, way more athletic than me. I did not get the good genes in the, in the, in the pool that year, but... Curtis Samuel is is a fantastic talent. You know, See, that was a better one of your receiver. jokes. That was a good joke. 
I'm gonna give you credit on that one. Uh, I, I guess the only time I have good jokes is when I'm making fun of myself. Apparently, thanks. Exactly. Anthony. Yeah. Uh, I think so. <laughs> um, but you know, the, Curtis Samuel is a very, very talented player who the Giants could look at and say, you know, we don't have that smaller uh, speed guy. You know, he he's very reminiscent of um, of Tyree Kill. He's like a knockoff of Tyree Kill. That's kind of how I view Curtis Samuel. Um, and he, you know, had a good season this year, 851 yards and three scores. It's nothing that's going to blow your mind. But he also had 200 rushing yards and two touchdowns uh, like that. And you know how Jason Garrett likes to use those receivers on end arounds and the receivers um, on those speed routes on, uh, off the edge. So we saw with Sterling Shepard a couple times. I think Curtis Samuel is the perfect guy to incorporate that with if you're going to keep Jason Garrett around. But I really think that Samuel is someone you could add to the offense. And, you know, you go out and draft a guy like Terrace Marshall – from LSU in the second round, a big body receiver who you can put on the outside. You still have Darius Slayton, you still have Sterling Shepard, you still have Dante Pettis. Now you have Curtis Samuel, the speed guy who can play in the slot next to Sterling Shepard, and really they can they can work off each other and confuse uh, coverages and defenses. So I think you know he's a talented receiver. I'm not ruling him out. I don't think he's my he's my go-to option. I'm going to put Allen Robinson, Kenny Galladay before him. But if the Giants did end up landing him, I wouldn't be entirely disappointed. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you're talking about Dollar Tree, Tyreek Hill, Curtis Samuel, I think he's a solid player. You know, he's talented, um, and it's probably, you know, not right to call him Dollar Tree, Tyreek Hill, because he is a good player. You know, he's not he's not bad, but, you know, of course, he's not one of those top-tier wide receivers that we mentioned earlier. He's not an Allen Robinson or Kenny Galladay. He's, you know, a lot of the times I think that K- Curtis Samuel is just better as a complimentary piece if he's the second-best receiver on a team. I think that's where he can really thrive. I don't know if he, when the when the Giants promise to make, you know, you know, significant changes in terms of the playmakers on offense, I don't know if Curtis Samuel is the guy that comes to mind. You know, he's not that number one dominant wide receiver that can run a full route tree and get open every single play. He's, I think he's a really good complimentary piece. Um, but there are other guys who, who aren't necessarily big body outside wide receivers that are going to be in this free agency pool that I think can be that number one dominant guy. You know, if you're looking at a, a guy playing on the inside, a slot receiver, you know, I like to talk about Chris Godwin because Chris Godwin, if he does make it to free agency, which I think there's a good chance that he does because Tampa Bay basically has to make a choice. Do they want to keep Shaquille Barrett or do they want to keep uh, Chris Godwin? They have to make a choice there. And there's a chance that they go with Shaquille Barrett because they have Antonio Brown now and he's playing very good football and he looks like he's kind of return into form at some capacity. So Chris Godwin could end up hitting the free agency market, and he'll be highly coveted if he does. But he's a slot receiver, right? And a lot of Giants fans are going to, you know, oh, why would we sign Chris Godwin? This is my, the most tired thing from Giants fans that, that I experience every day on Twitter. This is so annoying to me that everybody thinks the Giants cannot sign a slot receiver because we have too many slot receivers. We have one slot receiver on the team. It's Golden Tate. He's not going to be on the team anymore. Darius Slayton plays outside I actually think he would be better inside but he plays outside and Sterling Shepard is an outside wide receiver go look at the statistics go watch the film he does not play in the slot that often he hasn't done it since 2017 really 2016 and 17 he played in the slot those are probably his best seasons granted yeah maybe he's better in the slot but he's an outside receiver at this point in his career and we spoke to his trainer he prefers to play outside he thinks he's better outside so let's keep him outside Sterling Shepard is an outside wide receiver he does not play in the slot so that should not prevent the Giants from going and getting an elite slot receiver. Elite talent is elite talent no matter where it's playing. Inside, outside, it's elite talent. And we don't have any of it in terms of the wide receivers. We don't have elite talent. So if we can get an elite wide receiver to play the slot position and just keep Sterling Shepard as a solid, dependable option, number two on the outside, that is ideal to me as well. If we can get Kenny Galladay on the outside, that's ideal. But just we just need an elite receiver that that's it it doesn't matter if he plays inside or out so with Chris Godwin I think that he's arguably you know a top three slot receiver in the NFL he is phenomenal working from the inside and I think that it would be phenomenal to have him in there and just keep Sterling Shepard and Darius Slayton on the outsides and have Chris Godwin just dominating from the slot that would be huge for the Giants offense and even looking ahead to the draft as well with Jalen Waddle a lot of people don't think he's going to succeed on the outside in the NFL and he's going to end up a slot receiver okay that shouldn't prevent the Giants from taking him. The Giants should take him if he's there and they think he's the most talented player on the board. Just because he plays in the slot, it, it, like I said, this is the most tired argument that I hear from Giants fans. It doesn't make any sense. It, it just shows that people aren't actually looking into the stats and they just see Sterling Shepard, short receiver who runs routes really well, slot receiver. No, he's not. He plays on the outside. And you don't have to be tall to play on the outside. You just have to separate. And he separates better than anybody, which is why he's the best on the outside. 
because when you're playing in the slot, you have a cushion between you and the defender, and you are often schemed into open routes. You can just get open naturally. You don't have to work for it and don't have to get open using your route running. On the outside, it's much more dependent on your route running and separation. He's our best separator and our best route runner. That's why he works the best on the outside. So Sterling Shepard will probably remain playing outside wide receiver. And I just want everybody to know that and not be so freaked out about it because it's normal. He's been doing it for a while and it should not prevent the Giants from signing an elite or drafting an elite slot receiver. I mean, that, that's a, a pretty fair argument, I would say. Now, I, I'll, I'll say a couple things. Is I totally agree with you. I think Sterling Shepard is more than capable of playing outside. And th- another thing is I'm not afraid to bring in another guy to compete with Darius Slayton. You know, I, I'm tired. The one thing I'm really tired of is giving up wide receivers reps just because we have nobody else. You know what I mean? Like, let these guys compete. Let Darius Slayton earn his job. Earn those reps. You know, he did very little this past season. He was... Uh, you know, it looked weak when he was running his routes. He was not pushing the ball downfield. He was losing his routes pretty much off the get um, on a lot of these reps. So I would like to see them bring somebody else in. If they're going to bring in a big body guy, um, have him replace Darius Slayton. You know, have Darius Slayton be the reserve guy, be the depth guy, fight for reps, you know, be the rotational person. Um, and then keep Sterling Shepard on the outside and then draft maybe a slot guy on the inside or, or, or do something. You know, move Evan Ingram to, to, to the slot more often get creative with what you're, you're calling plays because it's so predictable. Um, and I do think, I agree with you, Sterling Shepard is more than capable. The problem is they were just matching up their number one corners on him and he doesn't have elite speed, you know? So when you have a number one corner against Sterling Shepard, you're gonna, you're, there's gonna be pushback. There's gonna be games where he doesn't excel, you know? But when you have a number one wideout that's commanding, um, you know, two defensive backs to be on him at all times or at least one, the number one wide uh, corner to be man marking him, you give Sterling Shepard that second assignment, and then you're free to roam. You know, you're free to, to actually get creative with Sterling Shepard. He will win routes against number two corners. But number one corners who have the speed, who have elite talent and qualities, will shut down Sterling Shepard. That is, that is my big con when it comes to Shep, and I love him. I think he's fantastic. I think that against CB1s, he struggles, but against CB2s, he thrives. You know, that's what we saw against Dallas, by the way. Dallas does not have a number one corner. They had one of the worst past defenses in the NFL this past year, and it really historically, and we saw him absolutely crush Dallas because they did not have a number one corner. A lot of the teams before that, you know, you had Denzel Ward, you had a lot of guys, um, you know, that were better corners that were covering Shep, and it really hurt his production. But I think, you know, if you give him that opportunity to face off against, uh, you know, those guys like Drake Kirkpatrick um, against Arizona instead of Patrick Peterson, you're going to see Shepard actually excel that's why I think they need to get a number one corner. That's why he was so much better when Odell Beckham Jr. was here and when he was healthy. So, you know, th- those are just my two cents on the matter. But I do think Curtis Samuel would offer them a good speed guy. I don't think he's a number one. I think he's a, he's a high-end number two receiver, not a number one again. So, you know, we're still dabbling in, in the second tier range. But another guy I would be I would be happy with acquiring, just not overly ecstatic. Um, the next guy I do want to talk about is Corey Davis, right? Because Corey Davis is another player who... Um, kind of saw his potential realized a bit this past season with Tennessee. He's a six foot three, two hundred nine pound receiver. You know, pretty bigger. He's a bigger guy. He's a bigger body. Somebody that I think Jason Garrett would like having on his team. This past season, he finished with nine hundred and eighty four yards and five touchdowns. Right. He caught seventy point seven percent of his passes, which is pretty damn impressive if you ask me. Um, I was pretty impressed with his production. He's he's relatively healthy for the most part. He's only missed like three games in the past three years, so that's a good sign for him. But, um, you know, I think Corey Davis is probably the cheaper um, of the three. Maybe he's a little bit more pricey than Kenny Galladay just because, um, you know, Kenny Galladay's injury really, really held him down. I think maybe that there's a reason I to doubt that. that. I think Kenny Galladay will be more expensive. Kenny Galladay is more of so? a proven commodity than Corey Davis. I like Corey Davis as That's well. Um, I, I just think he's kind of inconsistent. He disappears sometimes in big moments. That's right. And he's, he's, number he's really two. not... Right. I, I think that one. he's I think he's a good good like a great wide receiver, you know, and he can be the number one receiver on a team, but he's not going to be a dominant elite number one wide receiver like Kenny Galladay can be and like Allen Robinson absolutely is. So when you're looking at that, you know, that's that's when you are in the second tier. You're starting to shop in the second tier. Um, in terms of this free agency class, I think that the top tier, number one tier is Allen Robinson, Kenny Galladay, and Chris Godwin uh, being an elite slot receiver. That's tier one. And I think those are the guys that the Giants should be targeting. And, and that's the uh, the tier that they should be shopping in. The second tier, when you're talking about 
Corey Davis, Curtis Samuel, those guys, you know, they're solid and they can be your number one wide receiver, but you, they'll be your number one wide receiver for a little bit. And then your fan base is once again going to be asking for the Giants to get that number one receiver to pair with Corey Davis or to pair with Curtis Samuel, you know, that, that's how it's going to go. And I could just see that within a year, the Giants fan base is just not going to be totally ecstatic with Corey Davis or Curtis Samuel because they aren't just dominating like we remember Odell Beckham Jr. dominating um, when he was on the Giants and was our primary number one wide receiver, you know, and you look at that draft class in general, you know, with Mike Evans and all those other guys, just dominant number one wide receivers. That's what you're looking for um, for the Giants. You need a Mike Evans and Odell Beckham Jr., um, someone like that, you know, someone who can just you can build the offensive passing attack around them and you can depend on them and they show up in big moments, someone like that. And I don't know, the Giants, like I said, that that tier one, those three players, I think those are the, the three that you target in free agency. If you can't get one of those three, then I just think you look ahead to the draft and you hope that you hit on one of those wide receivers and you hope that either Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle, or somebody else steps in and is instantly playing at that Odell Beckham Jr. level and it is that number one elite wide receiver. That's what you have to hope for. Yeah, I mean, that that's really it. You really have to hope these guys step in and make an instant impact. Um, but what I will say is that's when you have tough a guy for like wide Saquon receivers, Barkley, though. Yeah, that, oh, yeah oh, it is. The Saquon Barkley thing is true, but before that, I'm just going to say with, um, like with Jerry Judy and with C.D. Lamb, like these guys were excellent wide receiver prospects, top tier, even Henry Ruggs. They're still not dominating you know like cd lamb was great this year working from the slot in dallas and he had a great season even statistically it was a really good season but he wasn't an elite number one wide receiver granted he doesn't have to be in that receiving core but neither was jerry judy in his uh receiving core which is far worse you know he should have been that elite number one wide receiver but it just sometimes takes wide receivers at least a year sometimes two to actually you know fully realize their potential and um make their way to becoming a primary number one wide receiver so just in terms of drafting a wide receiver giants fans yeah, that's what we want, hopefully. You know, hopefully we'll sign or draft a wide receiver, but signing one will get the instant impact. When we draft one, we might have to wait a little while, temper our expectations, and play the long waiting game with those guys. Yeah, I mean, that that, that is very true. And even when you're signing a guy, oftentimes it can take a couple of weeks to get, um, you know, the chemistry down because the timing with the, with the quarterback, there's so many uh, factors that go into being a good pass catcher. What I will say is that is why Allen Robinson is so attractive because he had so many quarterbacks over the years, a lot of ones that are inadequate, you know, Mitch Trubisky being one of them, um, and he still managed to produce. Like, he's a guy who learns the offense quickly. He, he adapts very quickly to new quarterbacks. He makes quarterbacks look better than they are. Um, so I think, you know, Daniel Jones would really, really benefit from a guy like A-Rob. Um, again, the most expensive player on the market, so we're, we're really, really talking him up. Um, but, you know, the, the draft is a whole different topic that we're going to break down another day. We're going to do the Devonta Smith uh breakdown with Chris on Thursday so that'll be coming out on his channel it'll be pretty fun Anthony's been you know diving into his his film for quite a while now so I'm sure he has some good clips for you guys and we're going to talk about you know what he does there but the last guy I do want to talk about um and maybe we'll even we'll even rope in Chris Godwin for this and make it six wide receivers because I know you mentioned him before um I probably should have just used his name instead of Juju Smith-Schuster because there's no way in hell I'm paying Juju TikTok dancing Smith-Schuster um I I don't like him He's, I'm not he a Juju is the, fan. I am not a Juju fan, mostly because the antics. We don't we don't need the antics right now, man. Keep the keep that crap away from New York. I think he's very you immature. Get, you will get torn to pieces in New York if you if you play poorly, yeah. if you play poorly and you dance on people's logos and you be a jackass. You will be tortured in New York, and he will end up crying his way to the nearest bus stop to get the hell out of here, because. We don't treat players who do that who do that crap very well, okay? And he, you know he's a six foot one, two hundred fifteen receiver. He is a glorified slot guy. He is a pure slot receiver in my opinion. Um, he works mostly strictly from underneath. He can work outside. He kind of reminds me a little bit in Sterling Shepard in that way that he is capable of working outside. But they use him a lot in Pittsburgh. The interior this year, he finished with 831 yards, nine touchdowns. So he's also a good red zone threat. I would put him at the high end. Uh, wide receiver two range. I'm not even considering him a wide receiver one. I think he's a high end wide receiver two um, with more potential. There's potential there to be to be discovered and realized, but it's just the immaturity, man. Like we've seen it in the past. We saw the New York media run OBJ out of uh, out of here. We saw what it did to him. It really made him just ca like just collapse on himself. You know, a player like Juju who's very out there, very 
egotistical, um, it will do the same thing. They will do the same thing to him. You know, I don't trust him. I don't even want to, I don't want to touch him with a 10 foot pole. He's young, immature. Um, you know, j- just stay, stay away from Juju and let's move on to Chris Godwin. Yeah, I actually do think that Juju Smith Schuster is a number one wide receiver. Honestly, I think that he is capable of playing as a number one. He's absolutely a high end number two. Um, and if a team does sign him to be their number two receiver, he, they're absolutely getting, you know, um, a, a luxury signing in that, in that scenario. So, but I think he is a number one. I just don't want him on the Giants because I don't like his personality. I don't like how immature he is. I don't, you know, there's a difference between marketing yourself well and being fun and interacting with fans through social media. And then there's a difference between doing that and posting trash talk about other teams and making uh, confusing quotes and headlines, bad headlines because of the quotes that you said while trash talking the other team in the media, um, while also turning the attention on yourself and your dance moves on the internet. You know, it's just a, a bad combination of things that just shows a lack of maturity for him and even Chase Claypool as well. Chase Claypool, it's a little more understandable. He's a rookie, but, you know, for him to be saying, oh, the Browns are going to get clapped by the Chiefs next week anyway, so it's all good. Okay, so were the Steelers also going to get clapped the following week? Um, and why, even if that's the case, that the Browns are going to lose, why is it all good? Because your team is going to be watching yeah. them getting clapped we don't need that from either. the couch. You're going to be on the couch. We don't need that. Right, so we don't need that. And that's that was Chase Claypool. That's not even Juju Smith-Schuster, but that's the culture that's in that Steelers locker room. And I do feel that a lot of that culture breeds from Juju Smith-Schuster because he is very much a leader of that offense and that young receiving core. And he's definitely setting an impression and encouraging that type of behavior. And that's not what I want to see with the Giants locker room. And this is not to say that Juju smith is some bad guy. I, I know he is a great guy and he's, you know, a, a well Uh, meaning person you know like he doesn't mean to do things poorly he's just immature is what it is at the end of the day and he clearly doesn't realize that that's actually harming the Steelers and I don't want him to come over to the Giants and harm them in any way you know and I'll say to the last point that I'll make Joe Judge might be able to straighten him straighten him out and stuff like that that. but right I I don't I don't think Joe Judge (laughs) wants to go through that and then also I don't think Juju, I don't think that's right to do to Juju Smith-Schuster. Like he's, like I said, he's not meaning to be a bad person. He just is a young kid, really, just enjoying life and posting TikToks like a lot of kids my age like to do. They like to go on TikTok and post videos, and he should be able to do that even though he's a celebrity. You know, he shouldn't be prevented from doing that just because it's he's a different. celebrity. It's different. I get it's it. Different. It's different no, because, because he's, of the way he's, he's doing it. He's dancing on people's logos. He's dancing that's, on people's logos. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's people. the difference. But he shouldn't have to feel like that's the problem. He's doing it in a disrespectful manner. But what he's doing in its own nature is not wrong yeah, to be fine. posting TikToks and enjoying his no, that's life. Fine. Right. That's fine. So I But it's like but it's that's like saying, saying you know, it's okay to drive, you shouldn't hit people. You know? <laughs> like he's driving, I mean, that's totally fine, but he's hitting people. So it's all not that okay. I'm saying to it, all <laughs> that I'm saying to it is with with in terms of Joe Judge having to straighten him out, he shouldn't need to be straightened out for that, you know, like he don't prevent him from posting TikToks and enjoying his life. Let him do that no, stuff. No, that's fine. Just that's tell him how to do it and teach him to do it more maturely is all. But if the Steelers like I said, can't get that it's done, something the Giants, the Giants shouldn't even do. Done. Well, the Steelers, if Mike Tomlin can't figure Steelers that. Steelers locker room has been a mess for years with Antonio Brown, Antonio Le'Veon Brown Bell, and everybody else. Place. Right. So they've had a mess in that locker room for a while. So yeah, maybe Joe Judge could straighten him out and make him, you know, a more well-behaved person on the internet. But there's just no point in going through that and. You know, just let the kid live his life on another team and leave Joe Judge, leave him without this giant headache that he'd have to deal with. You know, let's He'll just get paid totally by the toss it out the window. And we will watch them crumble, you know, with him. So uh, he's actually the perfect player to go meet up with Trevor Lawrence. I think that he'll end up with the Jags for some reason. But, um, the Jags, that's interesting. Yeah, I think he'll end I up with the Jags. I could see him in Miami. I think that he would market himself really well in Miami as well. It's not, not a bad thought. I think that... Well, that's the he's thing, though, is there. he's so he's, he's so easily Jackson, marketable though. because of he was so easily marketable because of his TikToks and stuff. But then he, mm-hmm. he just took them too far and it became a problem and it became a drama that nobody enjoyed watching. But at a time earlier in the season, it was a very marketable thing and it, he was a very beloved player. But, you know, everything is just changing because of the optics of how he's doing. You get these egotistical, things. you know, you get you get egotistical when, when you're when you're playing well and you're getting ready for a contract year maybe he, i think he's just in over his head personally 
immature and you could, yeah, as the word you said before yeah, I think you immature know, yeah he's, he has he has some he has some growing up to do but I don't want to touch him that's irrelevant he's an irrelevant player the Giants are not going to be signing him if they do I'd be incredibly surprised um, but Me the last too. guy we want to talk about is Chris Godwin you know you, you did mention him before he had a tough performance for the Bucks um, against Washington he dropped a couple of passes I think he dropped like five drops or something like that but that was that was an anomaly he is a very talented he carried my fantasy yeah. team in 2019 with 1333 yards nine scores this year he had 840 yards and seven touchdowns the guy's a stud right the past two seasons he's averaged about 74 percent catch rate which is insane it's 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 fantastic um, and you know he's a, he's primarily a slot receiver but he is such a good route runner, has such good size at six foot one, two hundred and nine pounds for a slot guy, that you know he's worth spending money on. He's twenty four years old. He's young, coming off his rookie deal. Um, he's a guy I would very much consider spending on. I don't think he's going to be uh, making as much as Galladay. I don't think he'll be making as much as um, Allen Robinson. He might. He'll probably land above Corey Davis and Curtis Samuel by a little bit, but I, I think it'll be a little bit over Corey Davis, but not by much. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that he's going to get paid a lot of money, actually. I, I think that he's going to get more than Corey Davis. I Like I said, I think he's in that tier one with Kenny Galladay and Allen Robinson. I know you mentioned he had a bad game in the playoffs, whatever. He's still been so consistently good, and he has been dominant from the slot sometimes. I know he's playing with a bunch of other talented people around him, so open things up for him. But he, he's going to get paid because there might be a stigma amongst fans that, you know, slot receivers aren't as valuable as outside receivers that's just not true to any nfl uh you know personnel member when they evaluate talent they don't care if you play inside or outside if you're dominant and you're getting things done you're going to get paid for doing that and he's going to get paid a lot of money it has nothing to do with being in the slot or being outside he's just he's a good player and good players get paid so he's going to get a, a big fat contract in, in the off season, and you know, like I said, I don't know where he's going to get that contract. I, I I think it's very likely that he does move on from Tampa Bay, um, and I think that he could end up with the Giants. Realistically, I think it could happen because I think that he can play in the slot, and certainly Shepard can play outside. But you know, just generally speaking, he he's going to get a lot of money. You might be um, underestimating it, but he's probably going to get paid very similarly to Kenny Galladay. Uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think that Kenny Galladay, I actually do believe he might sign on a one-year deal based on what happened just with COVID, the cap space going down, and his injuries. I don't think a team's going to feel comfortable giving him multiple years. I think maybe even for his best interest, he might want to say, you know, I'll take the one-year deal, I'll maximize my money, and then when the cap goes up insanely in 2022, people are going to be ready to, to throw money around. They're going to be overpaying for players. So I think it's not a terrible idea the Giants could be a team that can maximize um, on one-year contracts like Kenny Galladay's. Someone called me crazy earlier for saying that, but we'll see what happens. I, I've seen a lot of people saying that players could easily settle for one-year deals this year with the cap going down, um, that people are going to be spending a lot of money in 2022. Injuries took a toll on his season, not as productive as, as people thought he'd be. It'd be a great opportunity for the Giants to to get a cost-efficient uh, contract on a player as talented as Galladay. Um, but that, that, that kind of covers all the free agent wide receivers that we will po probably be seeing connected to the Giants. Um, in the coming weeks, the coming months. But before we wrap up here, Anthony, what do you think, if, if there's any of these six players with Galladay, Curtis Samuel, Corey Davis, Juju, Chris Godwin, and A-Rob, which one do you think is most likely to go to the Giants and what kind of contract do you see um, them signing? Yeah, like I said, I think that Kenny Galladay is the most likely just because we know that the Giants have interest. They they wanted to trade for him back in October. They didn't get the deal done. Uh, probably a good thing that they didn't get it done. You know, he was injured ever since they, they called. So um, it, it's a good thing that that trade never happened. But now looking ahead to free agency, it could have been a blessing in disguise that that trade didn't happen. And now maybe they can secure him in free agency. Um, like I said, they've, they're already interested. I think that they have just enough money to get that, that deal under the books. I think it would probably be a long-term deal. I don't think he signs a one-year deal with anyone other than um, the Lions on the franchise tag, um, but that's just me personally. But I think that, you know, if the Giants were to sign him, it's probably a five-year deal, um, and it's probably close to $100 million. You know, he's probably getting close to $20 million annually, probably 18 19 $20 million annually. I don't see him cracking 21 22 I think that's when you're talking about Allen Robinson, but I think 18 19 20 
you could see Kenny Galladay getting a deal like that for five years. And it's, like I said, it's going to be a pricey contract, but you should get your money's worth. He's a really talented player, especially when he's healthy. He had one injury-ridden season, but the rest have been pretty healthy and very consistent. And, you know, he is an excellent player that the Giants would absolutely love to have in their offense. And I think he would help Daniel Jones take his game to the next level. Yeah, I mean, that seems pretty reasonable. I think I would probably go with Galladay as well, just because I think he will end up signing on a one-year deal if he goes anywhere. I think it's in his best interest to actually leave Detroit. If they don't franchise tag him... Um, it's I in everyone's not... best interest to leave Detroit. Yeah. And, but at the same time, you could make the argument that Detroit shouldn't be spending over over amount of money on wide receivers right now. They have a lot of problems. They have they're gonna have new coaches. Um, you know they're gonna try to hit that reset button. And obviously, like you want to keep Matt Stafford around, you want to keep those things around. But you you're better off um, hitting the restart button. Maybe trying to trade Stafford to a team like I don't know, like the Jets. But I think they're gonna they're gonna draft Justin Fields or Zach Wilson regardless. But, you know, trying to find a, a home for Matt Stafford and try to get some draft capital back is, I think, in the best interest. Do you think that they would do the same thing? Yeah, I, I think that it's something that the Lions will consider moving on from Matt Stafford, whether that be via trade or, you know, cutting him. I don't think they would cut him. I think they would try to trade him. He's still, you know, Matt Stafford, to me, I think he's so underrated. I think he's a top five quarterback in the league when he's playing well enough. Or he's always top 10 to 15 for sure. Um, you know, and I think that when he's really on his A game, he looks like a top five quarterback in the league. It, it's possible for him to play at that level. I, I haven't seen him do it for a full season, but he's had games where he plays at that level, right? So Matt Stafford's super underrated to me. I think that he is a great quarterback. And, you know, with Detroit, they've just had him for a while and they've never been able to build anything around him. They've just, Detroit's just never been able to put all of the pieces together. So, I wouldn't be surprised if they hire a new head coach, a new GM, and they just blow it up and they just restart and they get rid of all of their talented players, similar to what the Dolphins did. You know, the Dolphins, you know, they blew it up completely. Well, the Giants haven't blown it up. We wish that they did a couple of years ago, but they didn't. But the Dolphins really blew it up, and now they're, you know, they should be a playoff team next year, absolutely. Um, they blew it up. They ended up with three first-round picks last year. You know, they hit on at least, you know, two of those, and... Um, that's Jets really did. that was their mo. That was their mo was you know free up a lot of cap space, gain a lot of draft capital, and then go ahead and rebuild the team overnight. And I think that's something that the Lions could do. So we could see Kenny Galladay maybe get signed to the franchise tag and then traded, or maybe they just let him walk. And I absolutely do think that we could see um, Matt Stafford get traded because I just think it's time for them to blow it up and restart. And I think they're starting to feel that way too. Yeah, I, I would one hundred percent agree. I think that seems pretty reasonable. Um, and if that is the case, they could elect to just let him walk, you know, save the money. They could sign and trade him, but I don't think any team's going to want to do that in a down season um, with the cap going down. You know, to, to give allocations for your draft and pay him, it's it's not going to be something that's very, very attractive. So I can, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But he's a guy I'm going to keep my eye on. And all these guys really are, are super talented. Obviously, I'm staying away from Juju, but everybody else is in consideration. I really hope the Giants find a good wide receiver in the draft to compliment whoever they sign because I do think they are going to sign someone just a matter of who but as always guys thank you so much for tuning into Fireside Giants and sticking with us through the video if you're at the 50 minute mark really respect to you appreciate you guys and we will catch you guys on the next one mm -hmm.